Ready, Mike? Come on up, bro. How's everybody doing? Great. Good. Jordan asked me to come today and speak on aftercare, and um, to me, that's something that's really near and dear to my heart. And uh, did, Jordan, did Jordan ever get a chance to speak up here? No. What? Are you going to speak today, Jordan? No, it's all you, bro. <laughs> Are you speaking at all? Well, good then. So I'm gonna. He's back there. He can't hit me from here. So I think after here is absolutely a vital portion of, of any ministry because, as um, I said in my house about three years ago, waiting for this guy that was coming out of prison. His, all I knew about him. His name was Jordan. His paperwork said that he was absolutely incorrigible and unsociable. And his mom wouldn't quit bothering us, so we thought she was stalking us. So, was, uh, <laughs> so the Jordan walked in the door, and uh, he had a pretty big chip on his shoulder. He didn't trust anybody. He didn't trust me. Um, he defied almost everything that I told him. And I just kept doing what I knew to do, and that was keep talking about Jesus, keep talking about the Word, just keep trying to allow him to fit in and, uh, and be a part of something bigger. And we shouldn't call it after, it should be called after incarceration care. Because so many of these guys that we get, we get out of jail and prison and they are angry and bitter and they have no idea what real family is like. Remember one day, Jordan absolutely defied me in a meeting. He actually stood up on a chair and started clapping at what I had to say. Uh, <laughs> and he was defying me uh, publicly and openly and I took him into my office and we had a little chit chat. And uh, he told me basically he didn't trust me and he didn't trust the men in his life. So I asked him just to stick with me and to put some trust not only in me but in the Lord. And, um, and the reason that we're sitting here today is because Jordan submitted to the will of the Lord. He made an absolute change in his life and is now blessing so, so many other people. Amen. <laughs> And I don't know what other talk, I didn't even look at the sheet, I don't know what you guys talked about, so I'm just going to talk about what I do, I'm just going to talk from the heart, and it's so important that these guys coming out of prison have somebody to stand up for them. Um, the book of Philemon is a really, it's a great book in the Bible, it's just a little old book, and, and Paul intercedes for Onesimus, and that's kind of what we're doing here in prison ministry, is we are taking these guys that are coming out of prison and we're interceding for them to try to get them integrated back into our community. Our house is in Pacific Grove and Pacific Grove is marketed as America's last hometown. So when we rolled in there five years ago, it was with guys with tattoos and shaved heads and uh, we made quite a scene, but we put our faith in the Lord and we really dug into a program and, and worked on rehabilitation and the Lord has absolutely blessed that and we currently have 20 guys, 24 guys in two locations in Pacific Grove and it's just all about rehabilitating these guys, working with them. Um, I was running late because we were actually, we took 20 guys up to a, a uh, what they call a, a high ropes course up in the redwood trees. Um, it's up at Koinonia Campgrounds. If you've never been there, I would recommend you go there. It's very scary. Um, but to get these guys up there and to begin to work on teamwork, to get them to put their faith and their trust in their fellow, their fellow housemate, their fellow man. And so many of these guys, we have a problem with trust. Even people, we have a problem with trust, don't we? You know? So it reminded me so much of what we're trying to do working with and for the Lord is get these guys to trust us, to depend on us, and get them not to to put our eyes on us. I know when they were going across the ropes course, it was a really difficult part. The, the person that was, that was helping them through told them to close their eyes and just depend on voice commands. And as they closed their eyes and they began to depend on just voice commands, the rope steadied, it made it easier, and they were able to get across the course. Just listening to somebody and, not, and taking themselves out of the picture. And that's really what... It's, it's all about, you know, I, I don't know how many of you guys, how many of you guys in here run homes? Used to run homes? All right. Um, where, where I come in with Jordan is we are interested in um, actually taking people out of prison um, and actually opening an independent home dealing with people just out of prison. We had the opportunity last week to interview a lifer that has been down for 24 years and is up for parole in January. And uh, 
I had some preconceived notions when I went to meet this guy over at Salinas Valley State Prison. As we sat down um, to interview him, I had decided within probably about 30 seconds of him beginning to speak that this was a man that was repentant, this was a man that was ready to be released back into society, and this was a man that I would stand beside in the city that I live in and say, this man is ready for a second shot. I was very impressed with him, and I, and I told him that, and I told him I didn't even need to complete the interview, but I was just doing it to be courteous to him and to the chaplain that gave up of his time. But I could see right into this man, into his heart, that the Lord had done a work in him. He was truly ready to come out and begin his life all over again. And it was so awesome to see that. And when we work with these guys, you guys, we have to have it in our heart. We have to believe in what we're doing. You know, I don't know. I know some of you. I know Jesse and I know a few of the other guys out here. And for you guys to be here, you actually have to have a passion to do this. Because this is not an easy road. This is not an easy ministry. I always, uh, I always joked early on, if I believed in reincarnation when I came back, I would want to do some easier ministry than recovery. Because it is a tough road. It really, really, really is. Um, dealing with people within the church that act, I'm going to say act like they don't have any problems, or, 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 but to deal with people that admit they have problems, that, to deal with people that are incarcerated, to deal with people that other people look down upon, those are the people that we really need to reach out and minister to. Actually, it says in the Bible that Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. And that's one of my most favorite and one of the most scriptures I actually quote the most. Because as we look around in society, people tend to look down on people in recovery or people that are incarcerated. But if we look at the number of incarcerated across this, this state and other states, it's a, pretty, it's a good, pretty good percentage of our population. So we either need to deal with the problem now or deal with the problem later. I know with AB 109... There was the big scare about all these just tons of people being released into society and how horrible that's going to be. And all the people that I've met released on AB 109, I mean, they, they're with my grandchildren and my wife and my daughters and my sons. I mean, just because somebody's incarcerated and made a mistake doesn't make them a bad person. I think you guys know that. Mm -hmm. I think that's why you guys are here. That's why you guys are willing to give up your time and your resources and your energy and to reach out to these people. But, but the biggest part about... Taking somebody in after incarceration is giving them a safe environment. Um, like so many people, when I, I went to four recovery homes myself, I was in rehab four times, and I was one of those guys that always said, they should do it like this, or they should do it like that, or don't you think it would be a better idea if you did this, or don't you think it would better be a better idea if you did that? <laughs> And I was a difficult guy. I was, I was sneaking out of the home, out trying to buy cigarettes, calling the connection, trying to score. That's what kind of a patient I was. But my wife finally said the thing you never want to hear your wife say. She said, well, then, if you can do it so much better, why don't you do it? <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so seven years ago, um, I went to the pastor at the time of Calvary, Monterey, of Pastor Roger Scalise, a man that I respected very much. I met him in his office, and I gave him my grand scheme of a plan for working with people out of jail and prison, and I gave him this whole spiel that I'd worked on very hard. I sat there, I smiled, and I said, what do you think? And he said, that is the dumbest thing I've ever heard of in my life. Oh. I was like, wow. So I, I got out of the meeting, and my wife, Michelle, said, well, what did he say? Um, I said, he uh, said it was the dumbest idea he's ever heard in his life. <laughs> And she, after that, she said nothing. She just went about her business, and about a year later, we were here at church, and uh, she was walking by me, and she said, the Lord spoke to me and confirmed what he confirmed in you, that we're supposed to open a men's home. So it's kind of a funny little story. So we, 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 we gathered up a board of directors. I didn't know what a board of directors was. Mm -hmm. So we asked some people to uh, help us start a board of directors. We, we founded a board of directors. And we made an agreement that the first time somebody needed a residential facility, they, we'd let them sleep on our couch, we would acquire housing, and then we would make the move. And uh, we didn't realize how hard it was to acquire housing for this type of ministry. It's really difficult. But there are a lot, a lot of laws out there that are actually made to protect groups of under six. I don't know if you guys know that or not. It's called Not In My Backyard. But we can start facilities that are six or less without any permission, without the neighbors or anything. But you just have to find the landlord that's going to actually allow you to do that. Um, so we, we got the church involved. We moved the facility, and we were ready to go. We moved on a Saturday and a Sunday. Monday morning, the bridge was going to begin. 
we went out to wake up our one and only guy, and there was a note on his pillow that he left in the middle of the night. <laughs> so it was like, Lord, did we really hear from you? <laughs> so we sat for about six weeks with an empty house, and uh, the Lord began to bring people into the ministry. And the thing that we have to do with these guys is we have to begin to show them that somebody cares about them. You know, I, I say, and I don't say this in a mean fashion, I say most guys coming out of jail and prison have, have, have father issues. Um, I myself had severe, severe father issues that I think a lot of people have. And it, it causes us to not trust those around us. It causes us to not be able to believe into somebody else. But as we can get these men and begin to work with them, make them begin to feel better about themselves, make them really feel loved. I mean, I tell my guys all the time that I love them. And I don't say that lightly. I, I say it because I actually I, I do love each and every one of them, um, even the hard ones like Jordan. But, you know, <laughs> hey, Jordan, how much time do I have? Because I can go for about an hour and a half. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, seriously, how much time do I have? Till six? <laughs> Till six? No. Uh, I'm just getting ready to get into my Bible study. No, I'm kidding, so, sorry. Until but, 20 minutes. 40 minutes. But, it's just about, how many, how many, I put pretty, how many people in here are believers? Amen. Yeah. I like that. I like that. It's about showing these guys the love of Christ when they don't understand it, when they don't get it. When I started going into recovery, I didn't believe in God. I wanted so bad to believe in something. Uh, I went into a secular recovery home. They told me to, to, that my, to do a higher power thing. You guys ever hear that? Mm -hmm. yeah. Drives me nuts. <laughs> so my higher power for a year was the ocean. I would go visit the ocean, I would walk in the ocean, I would drink my coffee in the ocean. But you know, the only thing about that was it never did anything for me. You know, they were happy to take $750 a day from my insurance company while I walked in the ocean in the afternoon. You know? Sadly enough, my insurance company spent about $56,000 on my recovery, um, only to fail miserably. Um, I ended up homeless, living in my car, not allowed to see my wife or kids. Um, I was actually living in the very, this very parking lot here at Calvary Monterey. My family attended this church. I would come at night in my van, make a spot in the back. I would sleep here at night. And then I would go out during the day and kind of do some little side jobs, get enough money to do some heroin. I was a heroin addict for 20 years. And, and that's just kind of what I did. It wasn't until that I met the Lord Jesus Christ and he changed my life like that. Amen. It was instantaneous. That I knew there was a God. I knew that he loved me. And I knew that things for the first time in my life were going to be okay. I, I, I didn't feel alone anymore. And from that moment on, I just kind of got busy. You know, I made one of those little deals with the Lord. And I said, Lord, I, will, um, so I wasn't all the way ready. I said, Lord, I'll work half as hard for you as I did scoring dope. And, and that was the deal I started out with. And then very shortly, it was, Lord, I will work for you with every ounce of my fiber to do what you want me to do. Even if it is the stupidest thing anybody's ever heard of in their life. Um, when the Lord gives you something in your heart to do, you have to do it. It doesn't matter what other people think about it. It doesn't matter what anybody says about it. It doesn't matter what the neighbors say about it or what people think about it. All that matters is what you want to do and that you do it to the best of your ability. Amen. Because the Lord will provide you with the strength. He'll provide you with the finances. When we started the bridge seven years ago, we had enough money to operate for five and a half weeks. And then we were going to be broke. Um, seven years later, we're still operational, and we, we're very blessed in what we do. And like I said, working with Jordan has been an absolute blessing to watch him grow. Um, I think he was kind of mad at me that I wasn't here this morning, but that's okay. Um, I, I was out with my group of men that are in the bridge, and we were you know, doing some team building, and uh, it's great to watch Jordan grow. Not only as a believer, it's, it's awesome to watch him grow and then reach back to help those that are incarcerated like he was to have a better future for themselves. So Jordan is somebody that really got it, that really came in with that bad attitude, that really fought the system, that had that absolute conversion, and then began to understand what it means to be a believer and what it means to do a work for the Lord. And uh, I like to see him be on his own. I, I love seeing him do it. He's doing an awesome job here. And uh, you guys, the Lord is powerful and mighty, and he can do absolutely anything. Amen. You know? Amen. It takes people like you guys, I just want to encourage you, people like you guys to make a difference in somebody's life. 
I look at this guy that's been down for 24 years. He's not going to be the most popular guy. First thing people ask when I say I interviewed somebody for the bridge at Slaves Valley State Prison was, well, how long is he in for? Well, he's in for life. What do you do? <laughs> and they want to hear something like robbery, burglary, you know, first degree murder. And it scares them. It, it scares them. But when I look at this guy and I look in his eyes, I see the work that the Lord has done within his life, within his heart, and it doesn't scare me at all. I know this is a guy that the Lord is going to give a second chance to. I know this is a guy that's going to be back into society. And how dare us do anything but the best we can do for this guy, regardless of what he has done? Amen. You know, we as a society, we put things in order, don't we? You know, we, we put things in order. We put sins in order, don't we? If you're a robber, you're here. If you're a murderer, you're down here. If you're a pedophile, you're down here. The Lord doesn't put sin in order at all. The Lord said sin is sin it's all wrong. But we as a society, we tend to put sin in order and we tend to categorize and we tend to put labels on people and that's wrong. That's absolutely wrong. If we're in this type of ministry, we're to love them as Christ loved them. We're not to judge them. We're not to point fingers. If they've done their time, they've done their time. Mm -hmm. I can't think of what I would have done if I would have turned my back on Jordan. Jordan was the very first person we've ever taken in that was actually coming out of prison, and it kind of scared me. I didn't know what to expect. You know, I was going to have to tell people that we were bringing prisoners into the city of Pacific Grove, and, and they didn't want to hear it. There were rumors going around, and they got back to the mayor, and they were calling the city council, and they were calling the Chamber of Commerce, and it was just on and on and on and on. But I had to believe in that the Lord would, the Lord would intercede and the Lord would bless the work that he started, and he has. Amen. And... Uh, it's just awesome to see what he's doing, and it's, it's awesome to see you guys. And I would encourage you, I don't know what all of you guys are doing within the prison ministry, but it takes a special type of man or woman to work with the incarcerated. It really does. It has to be a calling from God to be able to put your own interest aside and work with people to give them an opportunity to have a second chance. I want you to think for a minute, what if that was you sitting in prison? But if you were sitting in prison with a number that, with an L attached to the end of it, and you thought you were going to breathe your last in, in a prison cell. Uh, many, many years ago, I was a firefighter paramedic for about 18 years. It was an interesting combination. I was a firefighter paramedic heroin addict um, for 17 and a half years. But it used to really bother me when I would go into Salinas Valley State Prison or to Soledad Prison and, and work on somebody that, that would end up dying it really bothered me walking away from that body after we pronounced them, knowing that they died in prison, that they died alone, and wondering if anybody even cared about them, if they had any family, if they had any friends, did anybody worry about them or wonder about them. So there are people that are getting out, praise the Lord. It takes people like you, it takes people like me, it takes churches and ministries to get together, to band together, to pull together, to make it possible for these men and women coming out of prison to have a place to go. Because eventually, they're going to be, they can end up being your neighbors. You know, and isn't it our calling to do the best that we can to minister to the people, to show them the love of Christ, to show them they have an opportunity, that they can begin to be a part of the solution and rather part of the problem? That's what it's all about. You know, as we think of that scripture, Jesus came to seek and save that which was lost. All of Jesus Christ's ministry was aimed at what? At the lost. The tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes. You know, there's, there's not a lot of scripture that talks about Jesus Christ hanging out and eating with all the, the, the well-to-do, is there? You know, all the ministry is talking about the, law, the lost sheep, the lost coin, the lost son. Jesus' ministry was to those that are lost. And right now, the most visible people group that we have that are lost are the people that are incarcerated. And those people are sitting behind bars, behind prison walls. They can do nothing they depend on us. Meeting in groups such as this, being in communities, having homes, preparing things for them to be able to have a chance when they get out. And do we owe them anything less than that? You know, we owe them our best. Because many of them, if they had to do it all over again, would they choose the same? How many of you guys in here have made a mistake? If you had the choice to do it all over again, would you make the same mistake? How would you like to have to live that mistake for the rest of your life and have it affect the rest of your life? See, these guys hopefully are going to be getting a second chance, some of them a third, some of them a fourth, 
but it's our job to provide the best environment, the best place, the best advice, the best fellowship, the best, best brotherhood, the, the best amount of love that we can give them and show them a different way. But they don't have to keep doing this over and over again. You guys all know the recidiv recidivism rate, don't we? Mm -hmm. How high it is. It's just unbelievable. But I believe that as we get these men and women out, as we love them, some of them for the first time, some of them don't know what it's like to have a father or a mother figure in their life. They don't know what it's like to sit around the family dinner table. They don't know what it's like to do laundry. They don't know what it's like to do chores. They don't know what it's like to be angry and not lash out. It's our job to teach them those simple, basic skills. Now, I couldn't imagine coming out of prison not knowing what a cell phone is or how, to, or how to write a check or never having a driver's license. The first man that I ever met that was in prison, um, I met him many, many years ago. His name was Robert Drapo. Um, he began to witness to me, it was funny, he was witnessing to me as I was at his bus stop, and I just let him do his whole spiel. Um, I didn't tell him who I was, I didn't tell him that I was a pastor, and uh, he just gave me this whole spiel. I told him Jesus loved me and all this stuff, I took his flyer, it was from a Victory Outreach in, in, in Seaside here, and uh, Robert had just gotten out of prison after a 15 year stretch for second degree murder. Um, about a month after I met him, I moved him into a, my wife and I's house, and everybody thought we were crazy. My family thought it were crazy. My mother-in-law hated me for it. My kids wondered what we were doing. But Robert has, has gone on to be one of our dearest friends. He's my son's best friend. I officiated his wedding about three years ago. He owns his own business. He's doing great. He just needed somebody to give him a break. Yeah. You know. So as you guys leave this conference and you think about it and you pray about it, we owe these guys nothing less than our best. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Amen.